the Gilda's maximum lawyers community of legal entrepreneurs who are taking their businesses and lives to the next level. As a Guild member, you'll build relationships, be held accountable, and learn strategies specifically designed to get you unstuck and accelerate your plan for growth. Members are also granted exclusive access to masterminds hosted around the country. Our next event is coming up, and we're heading to Scottsdale, Arizona. There's something truly magical about the power of these in-person connections where real-time breakthroughs happen. Picture this. You're surrounded by like-minded law firm owners tackling your business and mindset challenges together. The energy is electric, the insights are transformative, and the results are game-changing. Investing in yourself is the best decision you'll ever make. The knowledge, strategies, and breakthroughs you'll gain are priceless assets that will supercharge your practice and propel you forward. Join the Guild and secure your ticket to Scottsdale at the best possible price by visiting maxlawevents.com. Welcome to the podcast edition of Maximum Growth Live, the number one program for lawyers who want to grow their practices. Each week, our hosts, Seth Price and Jay Ruane, tackle the fundamental questions about how to grow the profit and profitability of your law firm. To watch the program live, submit your questions and hear the latest episode. Tune in every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern on Facebook for our live show. Maximum Growth Live is a production of Maximum Lawyer Media. Hello, hello, and welcome to another edition of Maximum Growth Live. I'm one of your hosts, Jay Ruane, CEO of FirmFlex, your social media marketing agency for lawyers, as well as managing partner of Ruane Attorneys, a civil rights and criminal defense firm in Connecticut. With me, as always, my man down in D.C., Seth Price. Seth is the founder uh, and managing partner of Price Benowitz, along with David Benowitz, a fantastic white collar defense lawyer from really across the country now, I guess, uh, and manages Price Benowitz, which has got offices, DC, Maryland, Virginia, South Carolina, and up next, uh, I'm going to say Wyoming, uh, because I've been watching Yellowstone and I want to move out West, uh, as well as Blue Shark Digital, your SEO for law firms based in the greater DC area. Where is it? So that, that's a question I have for you through COVID, right? Um, you know, Blue Shark doesn't really need to have an office. Do you guys have an office now for Blue Shark? Because uh, space is something I wanted to talk about today. Right. So it, interesting. So I'm a tale of two cities. Blue Shark's lease was up during COVID. So given that nobody was going into the office, here are the keys. Goodbye. That worked nicely. Um, I think that what we plan on doing, we're in negotiations for currently, is a clubhouse situation. Probably two thirds of the space we had before where you're not counting on people being in the office every day for two reasons. One, we've taken advantage of the things we've talked about back and forth about hiring people nationally, if not internationally, but nationally has been a a significant factor so that not everybody is here and not everybody wants to be doing the surveys. Blue Shark, huge on culture. I wish I could get the culture of Blue Shark at the firm, but because of that homogenous, younger, you know, catchment group, you know, it, there is a culture there and they want to be there two to three days a week. So having space, um, we're right now in negotiations for something down uh, by Union Market, the hippest spot in the city with open floor plans and huge outdoor space, but not a seat for everybody every day. They'll be plugging into docking stations when they come. Ironically, and I'm sure you've talked about your space, you know, uh, you know, we are trying to consolidate. We had a bunch of space to grow into. And that was sublet. We had some real drama we could talk about in a future episode with subletters and decided, hey, if we're able to give back that space and consolidate, um, you know, we were able to, as we talked about, trim some practice areas that were not as profitable and really keep the core competency there. Uh, I've been really excited. I mean, look, I, I love scaling. I love growing. And, you know, I, I make fun of you sometimes for the crazy ideas, but I think that I'm as guilty. That's why I love hanging out with you as, as you on that and sort of taking some of the least profitable ones, consolidating both in, uh, people wise and real estate wise. And uh, that's what I did during COVID. So, uh, you know, bo- both both uh, law firm and marketing company, the idea is moving away from everybody as a permanent desk all the time. You have the people who are the stalwarts, they're gonna be in the office every day, but if you're not committed to five days a week, you no longer have a permanent office and you will 
be on an office share or a hotel system, but you won't be getting, you know, it won't be X number of employees and X number of seats. Some will be two to one. You know, it's interesting because there is something, I think, about lawyers in particular who get very territorial about offices. And I think that's one of the things about Blue Shark. You say, you know, you, you wish you had the culture of Blue Shark at, at Price Penguins. I don't know if it's possible simply because you're dealing with a, 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 an age range at Blue Shark and a skill set that is quite different from the varied age ranges, life experiences that you get at a law firm. I mean, maybe if you were starting out a new, brand new law firm and everyone was around the same age, you might do it. But I mean, I think back when I was when I was 28 and I was just starting practicing law, I would go out to I'd go out to lunch once a week with a whole bunch of other lawyers in a networking thing. I haven't done lunch with those guys in, in, in 15 years uh, just because I, I'm not, you know, I, I'm in a different point in my life. You know, if I can if I can work through lunch and get home early with my kids, I'm going to do that. So I think it, it just right. comes with the where you are in your life. Uh, and that's the great thing about Blue Shark is that you can feed off the energy of that culture and bring the best parts of it uh, to your law firm. So I, I hope so. But it's, it's interesting. There's been a lot of sort of, you know, the I'm calling it millennial culture, but it's, it's millennial down to whatever the new gen is, whatever they call it. So I call it millennial because they're younger than me. Um, I'll call it 20s, even though it's not technically millennials. They go into the 30s. But they're like what, Gen what Z. Seeing, or, though, they don't even have a good yeah, name. Is that, yeah. You know, I see the grind that we have, like the idea that you go to your first job and you grind to demonstrate and, and get your experience and prove yourself is not something I'm generally seeing. I'm seeing a quality of life and like people don't want to be bothered after hours. And it's it's that's the part that one of those things that I see more jarring. I mean, I know now you're trying to get yourself to a month off during the summer and things like that, but I'm seeing, you know, the concepts almost european-esque of nine to five with holidays or holidays um you know there again i'm generalizing there's some people that, that that can port both ways but i'm really um what what i see is is a quality of life desire greater than i saw with other generations where it was like how do i grind and prove myself and get as much experience as possible take malcolm gladwell's time on task you know, you don't see somebody trying to rack those hours up. They're like, look, I'm going to do my work, but I want to. And I that's why, to a great extent, I've deferred culture wise to David Brenton. You know, all of my ideas, but I've you know, he has his finger on the pulse of what's going on there. And it is pretty amazing because whatever my gut is as to what somebody would want or be happy with is is, is very often way off the mark for that generation. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I have uh, somebody that works here in our marketing department, and uh, I can remember, um, you know, starting out myself working at the law firm, and I, I got yelled at every day by one of the partners. And that was his method of training. And we had a couple of bumps. And so I would go in and I would raise my voice. And she's like, you know, yelling at me is not motivating me. I'm like, you know, yeah. I'm like, I'm like well, you say, that, you say that and you rolled with it. What I right. see now is that Look, I, on the scale of that, I'm certainly not the worst out there, but I now am, I have enough awareness that when I open my voice, you know, I would speak to speak that I'm not being viewed. I still think of myself as that 25 year old, 30 year old. But when I, I now have the sort of presence of their parental unit. And when I say stuff, I've had issues with people who are sort of deal with me on a regular basis that literally they, 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 they daddy issues start coming up and me trying to like push somebody like if something's wrong like there it is no longer that you can unfiltered say you screwed up this needs to be changed there's a whole new mentality yeah. and not following that is at your peril yeah and you know it's and it's interesting i've also seen that you know for me i'm still sort of in the client services, I, I still have a select group of clients. And I'm also seeing that in how I engage with some of my, uh, some of my clients, uh, it, it, you know, of that age group. And it's really, it's really sort of different um, than the tough love that, that I got used to um, that would came before it me. Does, it, it does, it does not fly. And uh, it's frustrating because I think there's a time and place for it. And that the idea that you could, that everything is okay uh, is not is not cool, and that there are going to be, and I struggle. There, you know, 
But, uh, you know, one of, one of the, I forget, one of, one of the thought leaders always said, like, you know, you want to get some more fast, do it yourself. You want to get there, uh, you know, you know, with with longevity, go as a team. And I've, I've had to take my foot off the gas, you know, uh, in one of Morgan's books. I remember him talking about the days before digital when like he would the weekends would seem so long because he couldn't get to building his his presence, uh, you know, uh, during the week. And I'm start, I, I have moments like that where I'm like, there's so much to do. I don't want to be like Hamilton. We're running out of time. But like there's so much to accomplish and so much that can be done for our clients and everything else. Like I wish that there was more of that drive. But it, 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 I, I acknowledge and see where the workforce is right now. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm learning something from that, that age group. And I think it's something that our audience should actually pay attention to. You know, I got to take two weeks off end of July, end of June, beginning of July. Uh, that's why we were in repeat mode. And, um, you know, I was sitting at the beach, didn't bring my phone with me down to the beach. And I was literally just watching my kids enjoy their time playing in the surf and the sand and then getting out in the water with them. And I, and I have to keep reminding myself that not only am I building my business, but I'm, I'm building these four lives. And, you know, that is as important or probably more important to me than anything else. So I need to focus on that, too, and, and take some and, and walk away from some of the opportunities that I have in business to focus on the, the, the time with my kids. I mean, my oldest is 11. That's not old, but, you know, that's more time I've, I've spent with her than I have left with her before she leaves for college. Right. So. Uh, I need to I need to find those times uh, that I can really engage. And one of the things I was able to do over this time, uh, you and I have talked about using uh, overseas talent. I actually got somebody in managing my email and my calendar. Uh, and then with some spare time, I said, you know what? We need somebody who can just wrangle reviews. And she's been with me now. This is her third week. We've already gotten 20 new reviews because it's her priority. It was always on my list of priorities to email clients after we took care of something for them. But now she's on top of it and they're coming in so fast. We almost can't keep up with responding to them, which is phenomenal. Well, right. And I, I'd like to look, there are two different things you brought up there. First, you know, the overseas labor. And, and I think that one of the epiphanies I've had, and I think you've been sharing it with me, is figuring out what countries are right for what tasks and understand there are things that are great out of India or the Philippines. It's very cheap. And there are things that the that Latin America seems to be able to deliver uh, again, generalizing out of billions of people, but finding truisms as far as what has worked in business uh, for those tasks. I think the reviews, and I like to do a whole show potentially on this, is, you know, that has been always, you know, a, a an area. It's so important. It is, there's software out there, but at the end of the day, it needs to be focused on. And I can tell you my own journey was when I had this as part of intake, it never worked because both you and I have been fortunate that we've built our firms where intake is always busy and busier and busier and that there's never that excess bandwidth. And if, like I had several times during my the last 10 years where intake when they were in charge of would say, oh, yeah, yeah, we got busy. We haven't looked at it in four months. That's yeah. not uncommon. Right. And so the idea that it's a person in charge, even if it's that person's one sole responsibility to call and remind you every day so that it's in your mind. It's part of that where it is somebody's responsibility. Um, I, it's just so incredibly important. So glad you you found that well, piece. And one of the things that I also wanted to bring up to you that I think is something that maybe our audience wants to listen to is that, you know, by going overseas, we've been able to get some economies and save some money in some other areas because, you know, the, 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 the stateside receptionist. Uh, I'm able to get a, a receptionist at half the cost overseas that can do the job. What we've decided to do is actually take some of the savings that we've seen uh, and actually invest in a full-time salaried position in office, in office, but we'll be traveling, videographer, photographer, that type of thing in the office. It's going to help some of the lawyers with exhibits for trials, um, but also help us just, you know, because right now it's been falling on me. Oh, I got to do videos. I got to do that thing. So now I'm going to have a project manager who has the talent to go out there and take the pictures for GMB, get the videos to put up on social. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing how that yeah, works. Like over a couple else, you know, look, I, one of the things my law partner, Dave Benoit always talks about is like, you know, if you look at this as an ongoing number, it's pretty scary. But if you say, hey, here's my number for three, four, six months, not not the end of the world. Um, right. And the idea that you have that in house. Look, the truth is with Zoom, we probably don't physically need it, but it's the same as the reviews person. If there's a guy there every day, his one job is to get content out of you. It's going to happen. And if right. the answer is it could be done anytime and it's on Zoom, it won't be. You know, we at Blue Shark, we interview uh, the lawyers 
for content that we can extract and use in different form and fashions for the websites. And in theory, we could send a link to the lawyer and they could, and I wouldn't have to pay somebody to sit there and speak to them and, and feed them questions. It doesn't happen. So right. it's the accountability. John Fisher talks about it with weight loss and other things. Like it's no different here. You're looking for video accountability or intake accountability. And with each of these things, it's so important. Yeah, you, and you that definitely kind of, need people. And I, look, that dovetails, I think, great to our guest today, because this is a guy who is a, one of those special, special lawyers of our generation, maybe one, one of the greatest combinations of legal acumen and marketing acumen in one. Uh, it's just uh, amazing to see what he's done over the years. Yeah, you know, uh, so his name is Steve Gersten. He runs Michigan Auto Law. He's a uh, He is personal injury. Uh, focusing, concentrating, specializing, however you can say in that in that district, uh, on serious motor vehicle accidents. He actually has something interesting in preparing for the interview. Um, I, I did sort of a deep dive, and he actually is does something that a lot of lawyers don't do, and he talks about right of head in his website about transitioning from other lawyers to his firm. And I found that fascinating because you know that's it, it's not really talked about. But there are a lot of hack lawyers out there, not in our audience, of course, but there are people out there who sign up a file and then go ghost on a client for six months and the client is have questions to answer. Uh, and so and they may not get them. So they may they may themselves be doing research and by positioning himself that way and making their a resource. I think it's a genius idea. And so I want to talk to him about that. So yeah. if it's cool with you, um, we're going to take a little break now. Everyone should know. This is actually a, an interview that we did earlier. Um, it's not something that uh, we're doing right live today uh, because we recorded this earlier with him to fit in uh, to, the, to the schedule. Uh, so we're not live, but when you come back, we'll be dressed a little different uh, and we'll talk to we'll talk to Steve Gersten. Uh, and then um, after that, of course, we'll come back and, and share our thoughts on it. Um, and I, I'm really excited about this in, in interview, Seth. So folks, hang tight, hear a word from our sponsors, and we'll be back live with more Maximum Growth Live. The lawyers who will succeed in the next decade are the ones who are focusing on building their brands where people meet. And there is no place better to build your brand than on social media. With the FirmFlex DIY social media plan, hundreds of lawyers like you are using social media to build their brand and become the one lawyer in their community that people know, like, and trust. By spending even just five minutes a day on social media marketing, you can engage with hundreds or thousands of people in your local community who will need your services. By cultivating a network of followers, you build a book of business that you can market to the next decade and beyond. If you are looking for a solution to help you jumpstart your social media marketing, look no further than the DIY plan at GetFirmFlex.com. The DIY was created by a small firm lawyer for people just like you helping you connect with local people online and build your brand and engage people in the topics they want to talk about. All for under $100 a month. To find out more, visit GetFirmFlex.com. In this world today, if you want to grow your business, you want to grow your firm, you want to take on more cases and make a bigger impact, you have to have a digital blueprint. Statistically, throughout the time that we've been working with Blue Shark Digital, our law firm, the Atlanta Divorce Law Group, grew over 1,400%. Seth and his team have years of experience in this area. Blue Shark is truly a part of the firm, so I don't consider Blue Shark any different than the employees in my office. Thrilled to have longtime friend Steve Gersten, managing partner of Michigan Auto Law. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Thanks for yeah. having me. We, we met years ago, and one of the things I've always loved about you is, you know, you, you had a multi-generational practice, which is freaking awesome, right? But you didn't just, you know, rest on your laurels. You, early days of SEO, created more quality content when nobody else was doing that and built out quite, quite a, a, a dominant position. And it's been great to see not only Michigan do well, but you've also sort of created a national practice with trucking. Uh, you know, neat. Tell, tell our listeners a little bit about how you went about, you know, you know, building your local presence, uh, you know, with what was, you know, it wasn't you didn't start with nothing, but you certainly created quite a juggernaut. Well, um, if you've ever read Malcolm Gladwell of Outliers, you know, I kind of feel like I was in the right place at the right time. You know, the Internet was just coming along. 
I was young enough to actually see it and, and I think get it better than a lot of older lawyers. But I was um, accomplished enough and I'd had enough results and success that um, I, I was able to establish that, that authority and that, that web position that started leading to the phone string. So it was just, it was being in the right place at the right time. And also, frankly, it was, I didn't want to compete with 20 other people on TV in Michigan. Uh, I couldn't ever figure out how on a 20 or 30 second TV commercial uh, that I could, I could be, you know, as, as Seth Godin would also say, you know, remarkable and different, uh, how you can have a purple cow type message to distinguish you from literally 20 other law firms that were buying commercials on television. And yes, Michigan, like most markets has its one or two 800 pound gorillas, but you know, your choice, I guess, would be spend eight to 10 or $12 million a year for three or four years to start competing with them and building a brand. Or um, for me, the internet was an easy choice because back then, and even still now, um, you know, it's sweat equity. And, and it, it, it's not like just throwing a whole bunch of money at it like you do with TV or yellow pages buy when lawyers used to do yellow pages. Um, you know, creating 10x content, um, you know, creating great content that people want to link to, creating value, um, creating something that's that's of substance and of help that you can't hire a, a blog content writer at $30 a blog to do for you, but that is something that is really unique and really good. Um, it's something that that doesn't take a lot of money, but it does take time. And, you know, especially when I was a young lawyer and I was building a practice, the one thing that I was always so afraid of was, you know, how can I distinguish myself and my law firm in an oversaturated field where the supply of lawyers is higher than the demand and you have a shrinking pie. And, you know, the internet was, was a really nice way of doing that. And it turned out to be a very wise decision that, that has paid off many, many times. So to, to um, you know, in addition to being a, a great lawyer and now sort of a national thought leader with uh, all sorts of, of awards under your belt, you've had two recent stories I'd love to talk about one at a time, one with an expert witness. And I know these things started as doing the right thing and passion plays, but also morph into SEO plays because when you do cool stuff, people notice and you get to talk, walk us through this first situation because most of our viewers don't know the story. And I think it's freaking genius. Thanks. So it's so funny because I have become um, a reluctant free speech warrior slash icon. And at least in the first case that you're referring to that we're going to talk about now, um, I have the seminal case now on lawyer free speech blogging that they're even teaching in law schools right now. So what, what happened was um, a couple of years ago, um, a few years back, there was a, uh, an expert witness who was that notorious defense doctor that never found anything wrong with people, always said that they were malingering or there was no brain injury or it was from, you know, hitting their head when they were six years old, what have you. And, you know, not real different from the same experts I deal with on all my traumatic brain injury cases. The difference is, is that this expert for a number of years she was writing things in reports that my clients would say to me when I was reading the report, Steve, I swear to God, I never said that, you, you know, this, this, this never happened. And, um, I was in Jackson County, Michigan, which is the most conservative <laughs> venue, uh, in Michigan with a very, very Republican conservative judge. But what I did was, um, I brought a motion to videotape the exam and I attached affidavits from prior clients that said, hey, you know, this is what happened. I never said this. And I at least created that, that question of fact. The judge actually allowed me to videotape it. And then she still put things in the exam and in the report that my client never said because we had the videotape. And I was so angry. So first i waited and we got a trial verdict and we actually went to verdict and i'm proud to say in that case the jury was so mad that i actually got the largest truck auto verdict in jackson county michigan and i think she was a big reason why because uh, you know the jury was so offended 
Um, and then afterwards I wrote a blog and I wanted the world to know what she was doing. So I wrote a blog, put it on my website. I put her name in and I, I wrote something like, um, I can't remember exactly what it is. Uh, is this, is this notorious on me, doctor lying, you know, read the transcript and see for yourself. And I literally set out, you know, what she testified to and what she put in her report, my client said, and then what he really said right next to it. And that's all I did. Now I, I wanted to do that because I was, it's sickening me that she's getting away with this and doing this to people because she's really ruining people's lives. If the jury had believed her instead of my client, right, who was, let's face it, a, an injured plaintiff asking for money in a conservative venue, they could very easily have believed this Harvard-educated psychiatrist over my client and turned him away with nothing. And he was disabled for life. So I wanted the world to know. So I wrote that blog. I included and embedded the video of it, the exam. And I remember my well. cross. Yeah, and um, what I didn't know, Seth, and this is where it gets interesting, is somehow this, this really notorious IME doctor was on the Michigan Disciplinary Committee. Um, in other words, she was, she was on the, 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 basically the Attorney Grievance Commission for Lawyers as a non-lawyer, and she filed a grievance against me. And not odd, scary as hell. <laughs> you know? well, um, odd that so, somebody like an expert witness who's like in that game would be odd, like who's doing all those nefarious things. The irony, like, oh, it was. It was so she she sends this grievance and she goes, uh, "My first thing that I'm asking for is uh, that that Gersten goes to Google and takes down this blog and all these search results, uh, which is of course easy to do, as you know, right? I just have to pick up the phone and call Google." But then she also was going and into because my license of your blog, blog when you Google her name. Up. Yeah, my blog was coming up first. Right, exactly. So at that point, I said, you know what? If I'm going to go down, I'm going down swinging. And, and I want the world to know what she's doing. So I wrote a second blog. And I really laid out everything she was doing that was, that was literally destroying people's lives. You know how in my case she completely made up answers um and and i posted it and that exploded so like you said it, it was literally trying to make uh, lemonade out of lemons um because i knew you know my biggest fear was if i kept everything quiet and we did things within the attorney grievance commission um you know my fear was she's walking down to the people down the hall, whispering in their ear. And I didn't want to put my, my license, especially when I had done nothing wrong in the fate of complete strangers where, where there might be political games going on. And I felt that the best, the best thing is sunlight and transparency. So I put it out there. I let the world see. Um, I am, as you know, I'm very connected with AJ and, I'm a, a former president of the Traumatic Brain Injury Committee. So I reached out to the brain injury associations of various states, uh, various TBI listservs, uh, the marketing listserv, which is where you saw it. And it exploded. It went viral. And I, I can't even remember, but I think it was something like 700,000 unique visitors on that blog. Um, the, the, the number of views, I actually had to switch from Vimeo because it was costing me a fortune, you know. Uh, so, so, but you know, all of a sudden, the New York Times started calling the Attorney Grievance Commission, the American Bar Association, the Washington Post, Reuters, AP, and you know, number one, those are probably about the best links you could ever get, uh, and they were linking to my blog. Uh, number two, when you're the head of the Attorney Grievance Commission, and you're getting a call from an reporter at the New York Times, um, you know, about this. And I laid things out so clear that the happy ending is long story short, she's no longer doing IMEs. She got thrown off the Michigan Attorney Grievance Disciplinary Board. Um, thank you. And, you know, I felt like, you know, we, we were doing a service. Uh, but the funny thing is, up until that point, even though you would think lawyers should have more free speech rights than other professions just because of what we do for a living, 
if you read the case law, we've actually had remarkably less than the general public. And most of the cases have gone down very badly for lawyers who blogged opinions um, where they've been disciplined. And my case is really the first case where it all got thrown out and they said I had a First Amendment right uh, to, to reveal all of this. So it was, it was a happy ending all the way around. That's awesome. Uh, before I flip to Jay, I don't want to talk about your, the market that you're in. I wanted to sort of, there's a second cool story, which dovetails to a lot of things that our listeners are struggling with, which is obviously reviews are a huge deal. And right. we often, we hear about this from our, our, our listeners all the time and clients at Blue Shark, et cetera, where you get a review, you know that it wasn't a client and you're 90% sure it's a competitor. Well, Steve doesn't just sit back and just, you know, <laughs> hit the like, please remove button to Google. Steve takes it to another level. And again, I, I admire this. I think we've, we've actually started a few uh, campaigns using this, this strategy. But talk to us about the situation and, and how this unfolds. I, fascinating and the future. Thanks. Yeah, once again, I found myself a, a reluctant free speech warrior, right? So um, in, in this case, you know, I've been very fortunate and, and, you know, like I'm sure you teach your clients, Seth, because you really do everything right. Um, if you if you do things the right way, call people back, have empathy, care. The reality is most people are going to be really thrilled with you as a lawyer and the reviews are going to reflect that. The only negative. And generally, I you, and Steve, you generally when something isn't right whether it's you, unrealistic expectations, we all have those, you know where those are. Those are not surprises and you're well aware of it. And if you get one, that's part of the game, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about here when you get something that's not that. Not at all. In fact, it's funny because the, the most exasperating reviews up until these have been the people who apparently wanted you so much as a lawyer that when you, yeah. didn't accept them as a client and rejected their case, they got online and left a negative review because they got mad, and, which I, and it's kind of a compliment. It's also in the gray area. area. No, right. agreed. And, and Yelp and, used to have that, not, not for Yelp, not for Google, but that wasn't an actual, there was a period where you could get that removed because it wasn't a true experience for the user. Right. And they backed right. off and said, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like if you walk up to a restaurant, they don't have a table for you. Is that a valid review? And to me, no, because you've never tasted the food. So, you know, anyway, so I, you, this is, no, it, again, because, we because all have that. That's the bane of our existence. But, but the next level, which, again, in the last two weeks, I have started to see these things pop up myself for some of our lawyers, oh. has been, okay, carry, carry on. Right. So, so yeah, so that's, that's a whole nother issue, but, but so one day, um, I get my first really, um, negative review and it's from a person that I I'm looking and I've never heard of them. I, I don't know who this person is. And I, and I check our case management software. I check our intake software. I look through world docs. I, it, this person has never called our office. They've never spoken to any lawyer or any person in my office. We've never had any contact with this person. And under this person's name, there was a one-star review. Literally, just like with you, within a week, the same thing happened with another person. This one named Tom Mahler, um, who, again, left a, a one-star review and started leaving really negative comments in newspaper articles about me as well. Problem is, again, I never represented Tom, anybody like, by that name. Like below the article, they would just start throwing right, in the comments, nonsense in the comments, into the exactly. blog. Exactly. So, um, but again, I'd never gotten a call from anybody by this name before, never spoken to anybody by this name before. So I knew something was wrong and I felt something had to be done. So I filed a lawsuit against John Doe and I sent subpoenas to Facebook and Google. And sure enough, Tom Mahler turned out to be a lawyer competitor. Now disbarred, by the way, but a but it was a lawyer competitor who because was because of this or unrelated. Unrelated, but he was he was trying to tear down his competition. Um, I 
I, honestly, if I walked into this guy on the street, I wouldn't know who he was. I don't think I ever spoke to him or met him before. I think he was just trying to tear down all of his competition. And, you know, your clients, you, you know, the people that do this, uh, we're targets now. So, um, so I discovered him and, you know, that resolved with the first one star Google review, which was by someone named Patrick Anderson. They objected to my subpoena. Uh, he had hired a, a very well known, no fault appellate attorney in Michigan, which by the way, is a huge tell. It's a huge red flag because this appellate attorney doesn't advertise to the public. And if you didn't know who he was as a lawyer, there was no way you would know who he is. So that was already a huge tell that, that the person behind this Patrick Anderson review was also a lawyer, because how else would they have known to hire this lawyer to represent him out of 65,000 Michigan lawyers, right? You know, the, the public would never know. So uh, they, they objected. The trial court, I think, was really afraid of the issue. Um, and even though from, from day one, my position has always been, look, I understand and I fully support the First Amendment and the Constitution and free speech. But when someone is creating fake account names and then leaving reviews under fake account names, we should be allowed the most limited discovery to see if this is actually a, a real person, a member of the public, someone that was a client, or even someone who just contacted my law firm before and got mad that I didn't accept their case. That's one thing. But if it's a lawyer competitor who's trying to create, you know, a bunch of fake names to then leave fake one star reviews to hurt your online reputation and tear down your business and affect your livelihood, then we should be able to know. And my point was, you can't call it protected speech until you know who the person is that is leaving those reviews. So it may be protected speech, but it may not. If it's a lawyer competitor, it clearly is defamation because they are trying to, to affect your reputation in a negative way. And what I told the court was this, if it turns out this person, and you could even do it in camera judge, if it turns out this was ever a, a member of the public, a client, or even someone who called and got mad that I didn't accept their case, I'll dismiss my case. I'll dismiss it in 10 minutes. But if it's a lawyer competitor who's creating fake account names to do this, then this is not protected speech, this is defamation, and we should be allowed limited discovery to find out. So that case I went to the Court of Appeals and the Court of Appeals actually ruled against me in, in what I think is a really flawed and very dangerous opinion. Uh, that I actually have on my blog that people can, can link to and read, where they said, even though this violates Google's policy guidelines on reviews, even though, um, you know, this may or may not be protected free speech, we're going to interpret this comment, even under a fake account name, even under a pseudonym, um, as, as with the widest possible deference to the concept of speech. So he might be commenting on your tie or on your website or on your shoes or, you know, I mean, unfortunately, even the color of your skin or they went to elementary school with you and they didn't like how you treated them on the playground. If you, if you read the majority opinion and take it at, at face value, then any basis would be sufficient. And the dissent, which I think got it right in my case, said what I've been saying all along, that I should be allowed at least the most limited discovery just to find out if this is a, a lawyer competitor who is unethically doing this to try and, and negatively impact my reputation and my livelihood. And, and if it is, then it meets the classic definition of, of defamation. And if, if it's anything else, then, then it doesn't. So that is the issue now that is going up to the Supreme Court. The danger with this case, I think is twofold. Um, number one, you guys do it the right way, but what about all the SEO people and all the sharp um, black hat people? What's to stop them from creating a hundred fake account names? 
and leaving a hundred fake, you know, one star reviews. And and the second thing that really troubles me is this turns the entire our society is predicated upon if you offer a superior product or service as a business, then you should win. That is what what our economy is based on. Our market economy is based on offering the best service or product at the best price. As a lawyer, it's treat people that are right, getting great results, and and you will hopefully be very successful. And again, this takes that notion and flips it on its head now. So what we're saying is all those things don't matter. That by the way, lawyer ethics don't matter because they're very clear, bright line ethical rules that talk about misrepresentation and deceitful conduct. And, and what, what should matter is um, apparently how good you are with ne black, negative black hat SEO um, so you can tear down your, your competitors so that, you know, you look good by comparison. And, you know, I am 100% sure that's what happened to me. Uh, in my blog, I talk about the four red flags that, you know, gave it away. How did you, how did you end up getting the name? Uh, the name behind the, the lawyer? Yeah. So, so I'm actually pretty good at this because I'm, I'm the current president right now of the distracted driving litigation group. Uh, which means I do a lot with distracted driving, uh, which means I send a lot of subpoenas to Facebook. I send a lot of subpoenas to Google. Um, in this case, it was easy. It was just like I've done a thousand other times, you know, where I'm, where I suspect that you have a driver that's, um, you know, playing on Facebook or on their phone or, you know, you know, driving distracted oh, for so any you, number so of you reasons. Got, you got the answer from the subpoena. This all took place afterwards yeah. academically. Yes, with, with Tom Mahler, the attorney behind Tom Mahler, the disbarred attorney. With the gotcha. first lawyer, uh, who was Patrick Anderson, he had already hired that, that no-fault appellate attorney to represent him who objected to the subpoena, and we went to trial court. Now, if I had won in the trial court, like I would in any distracted driving case where I'm trying to prove that you know I want to download a cell phone, I want to get to their... Uh, what they were doing on Google or, you know, what they were doing on Netflix um, would have been an easy call. But I think the, the problem that sometimes we run into is you are law firm owners. You know, you are in the real world. And I hate to say it, but I think sometimes some of these judges, they've never really had real jobs. They don't understand the, the real issues involved here and just how... You know, if you're an owner, if you're someone who's who's put yourself out there and risked things, taken risks, this is viscerally insulting. What's going on? Because uh, you realize I, I, just how unfair. It is. And I think sometimes I, these, I, I, I they, totally feel your pain. I did a I did yeah, a presentation with right? legends explaining SEO and paid search. And they're like, this is crazy. This is a monopoly. Why don't you sue Google? And I'm like, that's, th these are the people ruling on your case. But I'll, I'll leave you with one quick story before we go to Jay, who has a, a whole line he wants to go down. But uh, there was a woman in our market who was, had a bunch of people were bullying her online with racist comments. And she did a similar suit that, that is what you, you laid out. And it, they, they objected. And in the time it took for her to get that information, the statute of limitations had run for her to be able to sue. And so she went to the Virginia legislature and got legislation that is now passed in law, which now allows for the statute of limitations to toll until it starts at the time that you find out who is behind the comments that you'd be suing on. Interesting. Interesting. Jay? And that's, that's frankly the issue in this case, too. But, I, right. you know, so so that's the fight that we have right now. And it's going up to the Michigan Supreme Court. Well, it's, it can't be cheap either to finance this litigation. I mean, it's not something that you necessarily want to be spending money on, but it's something that you have to do to no, protect from yourself. From an SEO point of view, I'm looking at it this way. This is like, this is money very well spent. You can't you can't pay for these links. The New York Times, I've been at the Times a half dozen times. I'm not sure I've ever gotten a link from it. But if the blog is part of that story... God bless. You're, it's uh, that's that's gold. Yeah, you know, you're both right. <laughs> you, know, it's, um, you know, the, the appellate costs are definitely adding up, 
Um, but in the, especially the digital marketing community, um, this has really struck a chord and, you know, there've been a lot of blogs about it and obviously a lot of links as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm probably getting some of my money back and, you know, the reality is at the end of the day, it's all where you are in the SERPs and those, those links matter. So, you know, I, it, in, in the big picture, hopefully it'll, it'll work out just fine. So one of the questions I had for you uh, that I wanted to go over, because I think it's really sort of unique um, that you sort of put it out there, is that you are in you're, you are in Michigan. There's a lot of big advertisers in Michigan. I mean, I'm in little old Connecticut, and I know one of the 800-pound gorillas in your market um, because of his, you know, ubiquitous presence you know and 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 all the stuff he does i'm not going to mention his name but a lot of people know who he is uh and what i found really interesting about your website and i want to talk to you about it is right up front you talk about lawyer transition and how you have a system for it and a plan for it because that's something that a lot of consumers i think you know they they sign up with somebody right away and then they don't necessarily know if this is the right person for them because they were looking to solve the problem right away and now they they don't like the relationship or they think there's somebody else that's going to be better uh and and a lot of lawyers, you know, they don't talk about that on their website. Those, you know, but they'll gladly take, a, you know, a case that from another lawyer. But you go right out there and say, if you're not happy with your lawyer, you have a right to fire them at any time. Let's talk about how we do the transition so that you can be you can be comfortable with how we're going to do it if you take that role. Can we talk about that a little? How you came to that thought, and and really how other lawyers in your market sort of reacted to it? Because I'm sure that, you know, making a system for that, uh, for transitioning away from them and onto you is something that a lot of lawyers are like, hey, why are you telling people that you'll do that? Uh, you might have caught a little right. grief from it. So I'd like to talk about that because I think that's important for our audience to hear. Sure. So, you know, it, it comes back to something we said earlier, which is if lawyers just did the right thing, um, they wouldn't have unhappy clients who were shopping, frankly. And, you know, the reality is we have a, a very well uh, positioned website that shows up at the very top for most of our keywords, fortunately. And so we get a lot of calls and a lot of traffic from people, some of whom have already hired other lawyers. And the reason these people are getting on our website is because they're unhappy. Why are they unhappy? The number one reason is they never hear from their lawyer and that lawyer is not returning phone calls. So we, we get so many of these cases that, you know, and, and the other thing I should just add is in Michigan, and I think sadly in many other states, we have an epidemic of, of really illegal ambulance chasing and illegal solicitation. So we have lots of runners, we have lots of people that are being signed up with a knock on the door. Um, there have been, literally front page newspaper stories about lawyers bribing police officers and getting un, you know, unofficial police reports so they could send runners to people's houses. So we have that dynamic too. And it's, you know, it's happening to hundreds of people. And then what happens is these lawyers who are doing illegal solicitation and ambulance chasing also tend not to be the most, um, you know, have the most functional offices and again, return phone calls and get the best results. You know, they're doing things by volume and they're doing things in really shady ways. So a lot of people get suspicious. They get second thoughts, they get worried and they get on our website to see how things should be going. So we created this lawyer transition plan, Jay, to kind of answer, I'm sorry, my lights go off automatically when I sit too long. Um, I'll sit up in a second, but, uh, you know, basically to answer the questions that people have so they're not afraid and they know that if they're unhappy, they can jump ship. And what I do as a practice, and it may cost me a fortune, I really don't care. I try to do things the right way. So if it's a lawyer I know and it's a good lawyer, um, you know, sometimes life gets in the way. You know, you're in trial, there's a miscommunication, someone got sick, you know, so I always call the lawyer and give a heads up. and you know, and a lot of times I can put them back together and just say, hey, you have an unhappy client. You got to call them right now. If that 
client is still insistent, I actually go out of my way and I say to the lawyers, let me treat this like it was a referral from you because you're going to lose this case anyways. So I'll pay you a referral at the end and we'll just pretend that this came from you. And actually it's funny because now a lot of my best attorney referral sources are lawyers who I, I voluntarily agreed to pay a referral to um, and, and they, they keep sending me cases. Yeah, that's, the, that's the great stuff. And I've been on both yeah. sides of that. I, I, I've had, you know, I've had a crazy client show up and they put them in an Uber back to us, which I think was they didn't really want. And I, I agree with you that if you, you know, when, when it's in the one time that somebody had fired one of my mentors in town and, and showed up on our doorstep, I, I didn't see the case got signed until the following Monday. And on Monday, I'm like, how did we get a case from this legendary lawyer? Yeah, the person was crazy. We never should have taken those as a client. It was the biggest pain in the ass that ended in, in like, you know, so I, I just, I see a common theme through your talk, which is do the right thing. Good things happen. Exactly. Exactly. And, and the only distinction I have is, you know, when it's one of those ambulance chasing lawyers that is doing a legal solicitation, I'll take the case. You know, they, they, they shouldn't, in my opinion, they're, they're a black eye to the profession. They shouldn't be, you know, ethically practicing anyways. And, and we take the case and the lawyer transition plan really lays out what is, what is allowed under Michigan law, what is not allowed and just how easy it is for you to, to choose another lawyer. If you feel like you made a mistake um, or if you feel like you're, you're not in the right hands and yeah, and and like I said, we we fortunately get a lot of cases like that. I, I think it's a it's a brilliant idea to be upfront about it, uh, you know, and 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 really put it out there because I think that's something that uh, the consumers need to know. I mean, we're we're dealing with an access to justice issue in this country for a lot of reasons, uh, and and to be upfront about it, I think really separates you from uh, the masses. Uh, and, and I think just think it's a, it's a genius idea for growing your firm because it allows you really to sort of just be objective about it and say, here's what's going to happen. Uh, and, and who can, who can complain about that? I mean, obviously the people who are losing those cases could complain, but honestly, if they did what was right, they wouldn't be losing the case for the most part. Uh, and that's, and that's what we established. And the other thing I just want to add is, is again, this comes back to just the, the amazing power of the internet that, you know, we are finding clients, whether it's reviews where they're spending hours reading reviews, I mean, really reading them. And that's still even to this day, it amazes me, even though we get so many clients who read our reviews, but it's also clients that are spending hours on Google doing research and trying to find out roughly how the process works or more about what their case may be worth, um, you know, what the law allows and what it doesn't allow. And, you know, there is a whole generation that has been empowered and is now learning that there's a better choice than just calling a billboard lawyer or calling a lawyer who's on the side of a bus. Um, and, and this is why it is so important to, to spend the sweat equity and really put out great content and really think about how your content is going to be unique and valuable. And again, to, you know, to paraphrase Eric Schmidt, you know, from Google is, is how can we keep reinforcing our expertness, our authority and our trust? Right. Seth. No, uh, that, that's great. Um, Jay, you have a final question? So uh, the last thing I wanted to, uh, to talk about is something that we kind of already talked about. But in your market, uh, you've differentiated yourself online with, uh, with those 800-pound gorillas, those TV mass marketers, that type of thing. What do you think separates your firm when somebody comes to your firm versus one of those ambulance chasers, you know, chop shop type things? When they come to your firm, um, what do you think is the difference maker uh, to, to your clientele that make them want to leave those great reviews, that make them happy with your service so that our listeners can hear those things and make sure that they have those implemented in their own? So I would say two things. One, you have to be able to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. Too many lawyers talk the talk, and it's been 20 years since they've tried a case and stepped foot in the courtroom, and we've been fortunate. Um, you know, we have year in and year out, out, our goal is to get the largest auto accident settlement and verdict in Michigan and the largest trucking accident settlement and verdict in Michigan. And you know what? Most years we actually do. 
And I've been very fortunate. I had the largest ever um, trucking settlement of any Michigan lawyer or law firm. I had the largest ever auto settlement of any Michigan lawyer or law firm. So we, we are able to, to show that we have the results. But, and this is something I always emphasize, my best cases, the ones where I'm getting millions from my clients, when you read their reviews, they never talk about money. The things they talk about is Steve called me late at night on a Sunday when he was working in the office on my case, and he was just calling to check in and say hi, but it meant so much to me. Or, you know, Steve sat next to me in the deposition, and just having him next to me made me feel so reassured. Um, Steve called me from his vacation, you know, you know, just the little things. And so I was an economics major in college. And one of the things that I always remember is there's a very famous Hungarian economist. And I won't bore you and go into everything. But what he basically said is, is that, you know, lay people cannot properly evaluate professional services. In other words, they can't look at your brief and know if it's a good brief or a bad brief. If you tell me you got them a million dollars on a lumbar fusion, they really don't know because they, they have nothing to compare it to. They don't know if it's a good result or a bad result. What they do know is how you made them feel. And that is most important of all. That's why people stick with their Merrill Lynch stockbroker year after year, even though the guy loses them money every year because he takes them golfing, he makes them feel good, he goes to their weddings and, you know, the, and, and they act like social friends. But if you can have that kind of empathy, that kind of connection, and that kind of rapport with clients, and combine it with great results, so great service, great results, and it's it's got to be part of your culture. It, it can't be just something you say once a year. You have to you have to make that your core culture. So in my law firm, you know, I make it very clear: we are a trial law firm, and you will never ever get in trouble with me if you go to trial and you lose. Because that happens, right? If if you try enough cases, there are going to be cases that you won that you should have lost, and there are going to be cases you lost that you should have won. That's part of being a trial lawyer. But even when you lose, you increase the value of all the other cases in your office. Absolutely. The insurance company know that. So I don't care. You could spend as much money on jury consultants, on experts on these cases. Go try them. You'll never get in trouble with me. The only reason you will get in trouble with me if you are a lawyer or anyone who works in my law firm is if I ever find out you're not returning phone calls, if you're not treating people the right way, because we live in an age now of Google reviews and Yelp and Avo, and it's not like it was when you and I were growing up in the profession 25 years ago, where most lawyers felt like I'm too good to talk my own, to my own clients. That's what my paralegal is for. And we have a whole generation of, of older lawyers who still feel that way, which is insane. And, and the whole point of reviews is it, it has forced needed accountability on the law profession. And it's forced us to reevaluate how we treat clients so that instead of looking at them as a case number, we should be thinking more in terms of, of Nordstrom's type service, going above and beyond, of, of Disney type service, of trying to wow them. And, and really showing by, you know, by showing them you care. And if you do that, then the reviews are gonna come. And I believe it is a great holistic, healthy way to grow your law firm. And it amazes me that so many lawyers still to this day are so bad at just the very basics. And, you know, even, even just, you look at websites. Most, most normal people are scared to death of lawyers, right? You look at the, the lawyer poses on these websites and they have their arms folded and crossed and they're scowling and they, you know, it's the exact wrong message when people grew up in a world where they didn't know lawyers and didn't go to country clubs and their parents weren't friends with a hundred different doctors and lawyers. They were scared to call you. So those reviews that show that you care, that, you, that you're a normal person, um, all those things matter so much. A warm smile, being friendly, being approachable, that matters so much. So it's, it's always a combination of things. It's never one thing, Jay. But you know what I would say is you have to determine what you think are the core things you need to succeed long-term. And for me, it's obviously 
having having giving great client service and give and having great results for our, our, our clients. And actually, that's how we've now um, multiplied our, our lawyers. We started off as four, and I just hired my twenty first. Wow! So it's 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 a it's a nice way to grow, without having to do that's TV, awesome. without having to do all the traditional advertising methods. It's really been the internet, lawyer referrals, and and just doing things the right way. Education based marketing, speaking at seminars, doing all the things that I think lawyers should be doing, anyways. Absolutely. It really goes back to the core stuff. Folks, we've been talking with Steve Gerson from MichiganAutoLaw.com. Steve, thank you so much for being with us today. And folks, we will be back with more Maximum Growth Live. Hey, it's Becca here. I'm sure you've heard Jim and Tyson mention the Guild on the podcast and in the Facebook group. The Guild is this perfect mix of a community, group coaching, and a mastermind. Guild members get so many benefits including weekly live events and discounts to all Maximum Lawyer events. Head over to MaximumLawyer.com forward slash the guild to check out all the benefits and watch a few testimonials from current members. So head to MaximumLawyer.com and click on the guild page to join us. Now, let's get back to the episode. One. Well, Seth, I got to tell you, you know, it's interesting as we talk more and more to some of these market makers, and I think that it's easy to say, uh, for Steve, is that he is a market maker in Michigan. He's not the only one, of course. I, I think, I, I'd say he's that. What's incredible about him? He's beyond Michigan. He's got his Michigan well, world, that's true. but he's created himself again. When you when we start and we would see people who are sort of like the best of their generation, uh, you know, and you, you go to a, a Lanier conference. I think that he is the Lanier of our generation. And when we look back in twenty years to what he's built and done, uh, he's going to be the guy that people are going by the thousands to hear speak. That's really awesome. And we got to have him on our show today. You know, of course, with me, um, you know, it, it was interesting. We talked a little bit about systems and, and their role. And I think that's something that we've heard time and time again from anyone who's really scaled their practice to any great levels um, is, is that it, it requires you to have a systemized process to be able to do it. And, and uh, in fact, uh, we, we have him as part of my Systemizing Your Law Firm for Growth uh, Facebook group. Uh, and he's posted a few times uh, some some of his systems. I really want to reach out to him uh, personally, though, and, and get him to post how he goes about subpoenaing records uh, from Facebook, because I think there's something there that a lot of people can use, both on the civil side and on the criminal side. Uh, you know, and people are on their phones constantly. I know I I, I am, uh, and I bet you that stuff uh, is really valuable in the context of uh, a personal injury case. What are your thoughts? No, absolutely. Look, he, he's a he's a juggernaut. He and what I love is he's the, one of the few people that I feel has combined great marketing and SEO, my passion, with the substance. And to see, you know, you talk about subpoenaing things, to be able to leverage that not just to get justice, but then to create an opportunity from the uh, SEO game. Uh, to me, that one-two punch, you, you know, is it, it, it's a, it's unique. It's a unicorn type situation. Yeah, and I think it's really going to serve him well long term. And and, and I got to tell you, you know, he, he does a great job. Folks, if you haven't had a chance, check out MichiganAutoLaw.com. It's a phenomenal website. Uh, he's really put it together well. I've captured a couple of things, a couple of ways that he has it set up and sent it to my own team saying, I like this from a consumer point of view. This is really good to get people in, to get them into your funnel. Uh, you know, one of the things that's important is that, you know, Google wants people to take secondary actions once they get to a website. They want to see them clicking through to a second or a third page because if they click off after the home page, it's my understanding that if 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 you leave from the home page, Google counts that as a bounce. Well, um, yes and no. Or is, there, is it there, time no, on no, page? No, it's this is a question it's I had. So, yeah. No, right. So yeah. So like if you go to a site and immediately bounce, that's bad. But if you go there and you're there and you're there 45 seconds or minute or whatever it is, like it, Google, it, and again, this is not forward facing, but clearly Google knows if you get the answer to your question, that's good. What they don't want is somebody goes and says, that's not for me, goes back to the searches and goes somewhere else. That's what they're looking for because Google wants a result that sticks. So if you go there, click on a phone number, get your phone call and you're done, God bless. What they really don't want is somebody who goes there and says, this is not what I wanted. This is not the information I wanted. And that's what they're trying to prevent. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. It's it's funny. Uh, Google's you know, algorithm re reads things a certain way. It reminds me 
I got these Amazon Fire tablets for my kids, and there's a way that you can limit how much they can do. They have to read a certain amount before they can play the games. And my my younger son figured out that if you open up the book, open up a page, then put the tablet down and come back 45 minutes later, it gives him credit for 45 minutes worth of reading. So he puts opens up the tablet, puts it down, yeah, goes to play Legos, and he games the system. Yeah, no, I was going to say, we we, uh, we were actually written up in the local Color Colossium Bethesda magazine. Uh, our now 14-year-old, when he was uh, 10, 11, 12, you know, hacked our parental controls. He's cloned my wife's uh, iPad to be able to turn the Wi-Fi controllers off and on at will. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty much uh, at the point where we, we know that we're, we're not uh, gaming anything against him, uh, that uh, he, he generally wins that battle. Yeah, so uh, I have a friend of mine who's got five kids a couple blocks away. And what he went to do is he actually went and got two separate internet services, one for the parents, one for the kids. And he takes the power cord to the kid's Wi-Fi uh, when he leaves for work in the morning. Uh, so that it forces them off of it. Uh, that That's how he was able to do it. Uh, and he has his wife sworn to secrecy on the password. That's really just for her phone and his phone. No, no, no. Uh, if, I really want them off, if, they re- if I really want them off, the power cord comes with me. <laughs> Um, you know, this is uh, again, where we are, folks. That's really the only the, the only way that I've ever won that battle. Yeah, that's what. So, it is. so all right, th- th- this has been great, Seth. You know, it's great conversation with Steve. Good stuff at the beginning. Um, you know, I it's it's funny. We're starting to get promotions for a lot of the conferences coming up. Of course, Max Lawcon's coming up. Uh, I saw you're speaking, Nalini speaking. I know I'm speaking. Uh, I'm, I'm following that in the forums. A lot of good stuff there. Uh, so, um, there's gotta, there's gotta be, there's a lot of stuff. I know you went, uh, no, exactly. to, uh, we, we could do a whole conference show because this fall is going to be crazy. We have AAJ, um, you know, next week, um, you know, there's going to be, uh, you know, we have Max Law, we have Pilma, we have Filevine, it's crisp, you know, there, there is no shortage and maybe we need to have a conversation about like what, what's right for, uh, which, which people, cause it's, uh, yeah, you know. there's no shortage of these coming up. And right now I think you have to make some tough choices because, you know, you could, it is part of why I started blue shark is it allowed me, I was speaking because I was frugal and I could go to conferences for free. If I spoke, and I don't know if I'm speaking, I might as well, everybody else is selling something. I might as well have something. And that was sort of one of the that and keeping uh, my, my team together, uh, you know, but uh, we let's let's uh, next week, let's talk a bit about what the options are and uh, help people make some of those decisions. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because, uh, you know, you and I have been to a lot of them, uh, probably all of them combined more than one time. Uh, but people who haven't may be wondering, you know, am I going to get something out of it? And, and each one has their focus. Uh, Absolutely. So, uh, and I think that that's the key. I think that, you know, I always have a saying nothing, you know, nothing good. Getting out of the house, good things always happen. Some is serendipity, some is a speaker, some is the guy sitting next to you. Some of it's a people that you meet that become your tribe. You know, I was in a Pilma 10 years ago and I'm, I am still buddies with the guys who sat around me from that one conference. Uh, you know, uh, Gary Christmas, one of my favorite lawyers out there, uh, who, by the way, just had a massive hit. He had a, you know, one of those uh, crazy uh, eight-figure cases that uh, awesome. he was able to settle for a very uh, deserving uh, client. Very sad situation, uh, but uh, you know, the, the the there are there. I think there are huge advantages, and maybe, well, let's talk next week about strengths and weaknesses of each one, or not weaknesses, but like what's right for which person. I love that. Okay, folks, so that's going to do it for us today here on Maximum Growth Live. As always, if you want to follow along with us, you can subscribe to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast, where we are syndicated, or you can download this version uh, on our own standalone Maximum Growth Live podcast, both available wherever podcasts are available, right? Because they're not really sold. I guess you are, uh, uh, I I guess you can have paid podcasts, but uh, I don't know any of those that are successful yet. I'm sure that's the next big thing, right? Uh, Of course, if you want to follow Seth and learn more about digital marketing, you can follow his feed, this SEO Insider with Seth Price, where he interviews uh, the all sorts of digital marketing experts from around the country. I know I follow it because there's always a nugget or two that you're able to pull out of people. And of course, if you love systems like I do, please join my Systemizing Your Law Firm for Growth 
Facebook group. Uh, we've up to about 400 people now, and I'm constantly pushing out uh, new systems. Uh, and as I mentioned at the top of the show, I'm going to be adding a videographer soon. So I'm going to put up a system for how I found them and how I was able to uh, uh, recruit them. Uh, so that way, in case you want to do something along those lines, you have the skills to be able to do it. But that's going to do it for us here today here on Maximum Growth Live. I am Jay Ruane. He is Seth Price. And we are happy to be with you every week here, Thursday live, 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific. And that's it for now, Seth. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to Maximum Growth Live. Please remember to subscribe to our podcast for the latest episodes and tune in live on Facebook every Thursday for our live show. For more information, visit Maximum Growth Live on Facebook or MaximumLawyer.com and be sure to share us with your friends.